Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 98 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. In November 1789, Benjamin Franklin sat down and composed a letter to his friend, French scientist Jean-Baptiste Leroy. Franklin inquired about his friend's health, and then he recounted the ratification of the new United States Constitution. Of the Constitution, Franklin remarked, quote, Our new Constitution is now established. Everything seems to promise it will be durable. But in this world, nothing is certain except death and taxes, end quote. Franklin's famous musings note that he was unsure whether the new national government would thrive, but he was certain that it would institute taxes. Like many Americans in the late 1780s, Franklin knew that governments needed revenue to function. So today, we're going to explore one way that the new United States government set about raising the money it needed to function. We're going to explore the creation of the United States Customs Service. Gautam Rao, an assistant professor of history at American University and author of National Duties, Custom Houses and the Making of the American State, will serve as our guide for our investigation. During our conversation, Gautam reveals details about the origins of custom duties and custom houses, the role British custom officers played in North America prior to and during the American Revolution, and the establishment of the United States Customs Service and the role it played during the early American Republic. But first, in the spirit of the early American Customs Service, did you know that you could help keep Ben Franklin's World duty-free by supporting its crowdfunding campaign? Podcasts are free to listen to, but sadly, they're not free to produce. Monthly costs for producing Ben Franklin's World exceed $600 per month. That money pays for the editing software I use, our fantastic audio engineer Daryl Darnell, and hosting for both the podcast website and its audio files. So, if you enjoy this podcast, please consider making a donation to help support it. Visit benfranklinsworld.com movement for more information, or click on the link in the episode description right in your Ben Franklin's World app. If you've already made a donation to the crowdfunding campaign, thank you. You help make this podcast possible. Are you ready to discover more about the United States' first taxmen? Let's go meet our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is an assistant professor of history at American University. He's a diehard Mets fan who studies the legal history of revolutionary America. Today, he joins us to discuss the creation of the American state with details from his first book, National Duties, Custom Houses and the Making of the American State. Welcome to Ben Franklin's world, Galtham Rao. Thanks, Liz. It's great to be here. National Duties is an interesting book, because in it, Gautham explores how the new United States got its citizens to pay taxes after 1787. Specifically, Gautham investigates how custom duties and the officers who collected them helped legitimize the powers of the new federal government and place that government on a secure financial footing. Gautham, custom houses and duties sound really important. Would you tell us what they are? Custom houses are incredibly significant in terms of how governments think about taxes and revenue. They go back to about the 14th century in England and are basically government offices where officers collect customs duties or taxes on imported goods. Now, back then in England, customs duties on things like wool and cloths and silks, as well as taxes on shipping and tonnage, provided most of the ordinary revenue to the government. So the term custom here is based on the idea that it was the king's custom to collect a tribute or the tax. For much of this time, the king, unlike today, the king did not have an exclusive force of government agents or customs officers to collect taxes. Instead, the monarchs would farm out the responsibility to some 
typically fairly well-off individuals to collect this tax, and it was known as the tax form. Think of it kind of like a privatized IRS, where the tax collectors actually profit from what they're doing. After England turns to excise taxes in 1643, these are taxes on domestic consumed goods instead of imported goods. The customs taxes become less significant, but they are still important. And maybe the best sign of this in England in the 18th century is the construction of a series of really massive custom houses in London on the banks of the Thames, one of which was designed by the very famous architect Sir Christopher Wren. Now, what happens inside these custom houses? One of the things I really marveled at in working on this book was the enormous amount of paper that is produced by customs officers over the years. Think about innumerable ledgers and logs that were needed to record a really tremendous range of activities. And I'll give you a couple examples the coming and going of ships, each one is tracked, the arrival of specific cargoes, each with a manifest that have to be checked. You have targeted inspections of specific commodities ranging from things like alcohol, brined meats and fish, even pharmaceutical products eventually, and perhaps most famously, slaves. Each slave that is imported prior to 1808 in the United States is inspected. And then again, after that, each slave that's moved from port to port within the U.S. is also inspected and listed on a piece of paper. So what else are these officers doing? They need to tally how much importers owe in customs duties. This requires very close study of the laws and tables that spell out the rates on specific goods. Some goods are taxed based upon their weight. Some goods are based in some more specific percentage. Another thing that they're doing is regulating shipping, or as it was called back then, it's called navigation, to make sure that ships are being honest in going from one destination to another and not, if they're going from New York to New Orleans, say, stopping in a place like Haiti to pick up things that they're not supposed to. Customs officers also are enforcing Congress's restrictions on trade, where Americans are allowed to trade in some countries and restricted or prohibited from trading in other countries. These things go back way to the beginning of the Republic. And so you have the U.S.'s political relationship with different nations will determine what restrictions are in place and what need to be enforced. So take all of that and distill it down into letters, reports, tables that all have to be written up, oftentimes copied a couple times and then mailed to the Treasury Department where it's reviewed for accuracy. And they also have auditors there who are going to try and make sure that all the money that's supposed to be collected was actually being collected. So all in all, I think you can tell these are very busy places, lots of things going on and lots of things for me to find in these records. Custom duties were the custom of the king. And throughout the colonial period, North America had several kings who claimed territory on the continent. But let's stick with British North America for the purposes of our conversation. Would you tell us about early American custom houses and when they came to be built on the shores of North America? Custom houses come to English-speaking North America around the mid to late 17th century as part of a broader transformation in how government works back in England. This is something that's called the fiscal military revolution that occurs around the time of the Glorious Revolution in the 1680s in England. And what this basically means is that you have governments are looking for ways to raise money in order to fund activities like wars that allow them to expand. And it's kind of like a loopback mechanism where uh, you raise money and expand and then you need to raise more money to sustain yourself and then to keep expanding. And so the custom houses are one key part of this where they're going to collect money from commerce and channel it toward military expeditions. And so once you have colonists in North America, the custom houses are not too far behind. But the thing is that the custom houses in North America are a real far cry from what we see from those magnificent London custom houses that I referred to earlier, these were tiny, diminutive buildings. The first one that we really know about dates back to the late 17th century in Virginia. It's a brick and timber building on someone's own property. Another in Chestertown, Maryland in 1694 is just one room in a much bigger merchant's warehouse. In Rhode Island, Pennsylvania, all the way up until the mid-1760s, you have the custom houses, as it's known, is really the person's house. 
house, the officer's house, in which they have one room or a desk, which they're going to designate for all the business of the custom house. So in that sense, these are very much hard to separate from the private lives of these individuals. And a lot of times they considered the records that they were producing to be their own personal property as opposed to that of government. So they're very much part of the kind of ebb and flow of daily life as opposed to some separate structure that's marked off from everything else. And it seems like they were very much a part of the ebb and flow of the revolution too, at least early on, when many colonists targeted custom officers to communicate or show their disapproval with Great Britain's imperial policies. Gautham, would you tell us more about the role British custom officers played in the American Revolution? In order to understand that question about the role of customs collectors in the American Revolution, it's first necessary to understand what they were doing before the American Revolution, because it really sets the stage for what happened. So if you look back to the years before the Revolution, 1714 to about 1756, this is the period that historians like to call the salutary neglect period, where the British government is supposedly ignoring the colonies and taking little interest in what's going on there. And one of the things that historians have noted that was occurring because of that supposed salutary neglect was rampant smuggling to Great Britain's enemies in the West Indies, French and Spanish colonies. The thing is that people in charge of the British government at this point, and Robert Walpole is probably the best example, they knew exactly what was going on in the colonies, and they were very happy for the smuggling economy to prosper to a great extent. So it was the role of the customs collectors, customs officials in the colonies to have this very odd role of looking the other way as colonists kind of ran roughshod over British laws and traded with whomever they wanted. The British Empire gained a great deal out of this this little arrangement because its sphere of commercial influence spreads pretty drastically to the shores of its enemies, and it was taking away wealth from its enemies, essentially, while expanding its own influence. So the British Empire is gaining a lot by this. Colonial merchants are gaining wealth out of this and access to the market marketplace. So this is the kind of situation leading up to the revolution. And you see the customs collectors are playing this very peculiar role of maintaining the empire by not enforcing laws. Now, the American Revolution rolls along. And when specifically that that happens is up to some debate. I tend to look at 1756 as a very important year in that. And you have a different theory of empire that's going to emerge out of London, one that is far more coercive than the permissive atmosphere before the revolution. The key to this is Great Britain is in a great deal of debt. It needs to collect revenue from wherever it can and it sees the colonies as this place where for the last 40 years before, colonial merchants had gotten away with not paying these taxes. So now it's this very attractive source to them of untapped revenue. So they demand that customs officers become a lot more coercive, a lot more rigorous. And this switch in policy is felt very sharply by merchants in the colonies. And it dovetails with a broader set of anxieties about the position of the colonies in Great Britain, whether they're adequately represented, for instance. The no taxation without representation uh, slogan, of course, becomes quite famous. And the customs officers who are now asked to enforce the laws quickly become the public face for unpopular imperial policy in the colonies. One thing that we see that happens here is that the customs collectors become the targets of riots or physical violence to no small extent. There's some very famous examples of this, the one I dwell on in in the book is that in the late 1760s and uh, early 1770 of the Philadelphia collector, John Swift, who had for a long time before been fairly on good terms with the merchants and all of a sudden now is sort of chased down by a mob that really is seeking blood. The other group that's treated very harshly are those seen in league with the customs officials. So informers are targeted by mobs of merchants and sailors. And here are probably the best story is from someone else's book, Thomas Trucks's really good book called Defying Empire. He tells a story of a man named George Spencer who is just raked around the coals and beaten up pretty badly repeatedly for informing on some of New York's biggest merchants. Custom houses, too, become icons of this unpopular British policy. And the best example of this is the aftermath of the Boston Massacre, which 
of course, takes place just outside the custom house walls. And Paul Revere, in his famous print of what occurred at the Boston Massacre, takes a great deal of liberties, of course, most famously whitewashing the identity of Christmas addicts in order to change the face of who the American patriots were, but also making more prominent in the background the words custom house so that viewers of his print who are not familiar with Boston's landscape would know precisely where this occurred in order to sort of magnify the dramatic effect. So the custom house becomes a real backdrop of what happens during the years of the revolution. I find it really curious that the colonists loathed and protested all things customs related during the American Revolution. Yet after the revolution, one of the first items of business for the new federal government was to establish custom duties and custom houses. Why did the United States choose to establish a custom system modeled on the British imperial system it had just secured independence from? There are a couple different reasons why the Custom House becomes the preferred method of raising funds. Probably the most important is that there was really no other viable option. And it's not like the founding group was not thinking through these things. But the one big one that could have been available to them was the property tax. Given the vast amount of personal property, private property in the United States, this would seem kind of logically to be the most attractive and lucrative option for the federal government. But the big problem with this is, of course, that slaves are considered to be property. And it would mean that Southern slaveholders in particular would find themselves paying a fairly dramatically large proportion of the national tax bill. And this was really a non-starter for the South in terms of what the basic terms of unionhood would be and nationhood would be. And so once you take the property tax off the table, not all that much is left. The excise tax is certainly available, but it was very unpopular in England, and it was a associated with the figure of the taxman who would roam through town assessing taxes. Now, the customs duty is a lot more attractive as a logistical matter because you don't really know who pays it. On the one hand, yes, the merchant who imports goods does pay the customs duty to the government, but then the merchant just adds on what they've paid to the price of the good that they're going to sell to people. And so if you're a normal average person in 1790, a presumably free white person with funds to buy something, you're only going to encounter the customs duty in the form of the price of the commodity that you're buying. You'll never actually pay over a tax to the federal government. And so it has this sort of dual advantage then of not being a property tax, not raising the specter of slavery for a founding generation that was very skittish about talking about slavery. And then also, you know, conveniently not being a tax that would require a great deal of machinery in terms of collection and not being very intrusive in everyday life. In national duties, Gautham states that early U.S. custom officers didn't just help the new government raise revenue, they helped give it permanency. Gautham, would you explain this to us? How did custom collectors help give permanency to the new government? Permanency is a difficult concept to wrap one's head around when you're thinking through this second national government that the United States produces with the Constitution of 1787, because very few people at that point considered it to be an experiment that would end up with a permanent government that lasted as long as it has. One of the keys to this was how the government would manage its relationships with the people. The federal government was largely unknown as an entity because it was new. And this is something that Alexander Hamilton dwells upon at the Constitutional Convention. In his first speech to the convention, he says that he's very worried because once you get far away from the center of government, the execution of laws become, as he calls it, feeble. And then he's particularly worried about the culture around the sentiment would be of the people towards obedience. Would they obey? Would they not obey? Congress, when they were passing the first tariff law where the customs duties are enumerated, there's a great deal of debate about whether people will actually obey or not. After all, we know from the example of the imperial past that up until the revolution, Americans were fairly freewheeling in their smuggling toward the West Indies and elsewhere. So again, permanency is a very slippery concept. I think what the customs collectors are able to do in order to solidify and legitimize government is to soften its impact upon people. This was not a government that operated in a very imposing manner upon the merchants who were doing business in the custom house. Rather, the 
these customs officials find themselves in a much more accommodating role than a coercive role. So they find ways to make life a bit easier for merchants, to put it in the simplest possible terms, whether this means keeping the office open when it should technically be closed, that's one thing, whether it means a merchant who has obliged himself to pay taxes but just doesn't have the money, so you give him an extra three months to pay off the dues. It could also mean that the customs official is going to interpret the laws in a way that is going to make the local merchants feel most comfortable. It may not be what Congress wanted, but that's the way to soften the impact of a law that might otherwise be unpopular. So this is the approach that customs officials almost uniformly take in those first years of the early republic that managed to keep the federal government's relationship with the merchants who are are paying this incredibly important tax amicable. So this is what they do in terms of permanency. This is how they keep a stable relationship between the federal government and this very important constituency. You mentioned that custom collectors soften the impact of government power. In what ways did they do this and why? I mean, their job is to collect taxes or duties from importing merchants. And yet it sounds like they were almost forming positive relationships with these merchants. Did the government tell them to do this Or did custom collectors act on their own discretion? The customs officials are in a very difficult position because they are asked to collect a tax that was almost impossible to collect under the British Empire. And this is very important for the survival of the Republic. And just to give you a sense of what I'm talking about, if you take just the first years of the Republic from about 1792, when we have the first really reliable customs figures up until about 1800, customs revenue is almost exclusively federal revenue that is not loans. So whatever money the government's pulling in is coming from these customs taxes. So it's really pretty important. And it's being spent on things like paying the interest on loans to foreign creditors. So this is not a minor aspect of the political economy. So they know they're in this precarious position and they know they need to collect this revenue. And that, in my interpretation, is the key of it, is they're willing to basically let the merchants have a great deal of say over virtually every aspect of how the custom house is going to work how regulations are going to be enforced, so long as the merchants pay over, for the most part, these customs duties. It's almost like a deal has been struck. Now, if you look back at the British Empire, they had a similar one, which was not revenue so much, but a general sense of peace and loyalty to the empire. If these merchants were British merchants and their chief interest was spreading British influence, then that was part of the ends of empire and Great Britain was willing to overlook or sanction even their kind of smuggling activities. So, In the early U.S., what you get is the custom house becomes fairly reliable as an institution that's going to collect taxes, but it becomes a completely well-known secret that regulations that needed to be enforced were not going to be enforced, that the merchants were going to trade more or less where they wanted to trade if they really wanted to, and that the customs officials did not have the kind of authority they might need to restrict that behavior. It seems like giving merchants a say into how custom collectors would collect their duties was a very Federalist policy. What happened to merchant input into custom houses when Thomas Jefferson and his Democratic Republicans came to lead the government in 1801? This is one of the things that got me very interested in this topic to begin with, I have to say, is this seeming American tradition of letting the foxes into the hen house and then expecting government to work for you. But what we see here is that the Federalists do kind of make it work, right? They are able to collect this money, which they think is so important and which is actually quite important. When the Republicans come into office, they had campaigned to a small extent on how bad Federalist economic policy was. They were pretty explicit that it favored the merchants, the wealthy, who clearly had outsized say in things. And they make pretty wild accusations about how corrupt these customs offices are. They're basically Hamiltonian outposts on the periphery of the country that are spying on people. When they enter office, finally, they realize that this is not so. And it's almost a stunning realization to see that the Jeffersonians marvel at how ineffective these customs offices are at 
enforcing regulations on the one hand, but on the other, the Jeffersonians are pretty happy with the revenue that's coming in. And so this is something that they don't want to disrupt. Albert Gallatin, who will succeed Alexander Hamilton and then Oliver Walcott Jr. as the Secretary of the Treasury, really does not want to disrupt the Hamilton-inspired customs tax system. He, he spends a great deal of his time worrying that it might be by foreign policy developments, things like embargoes. But that's basically the reaction. And in my interpretation of it, this is a big theme, is you have the Federalists who are creating this system and the Jeffersonians and eventually the Jacksonians who are not all that pleased with having to deal with it, but who are kind of stuck with it because it does have a sense of permanency after 1799. Since you brought them up, why don't we talk about embargoes? Because it seems like Jefferson's administration passed several of them during Jefferson's two terms in office. So would you tell us about the embargoes and what they were designed to do? Between 1806 and 1815, the Jefferson and Madison administrations have, I believe, 24 types of commercial restrictions, which range from complete embargoes, like the embargo of 1808, which means that trade is prohibited abroad. You're basically cutting off the foreign market from American merchants. That's one type of commercial restriction. Then there are others where trade is restricted with one nation, but not with another. Trade is restricted with one colony, but not with a different one. And so there are a range of these different arrangements you can make. And the ideology or the rationale behind them is that by cutting off American trade with, say, Great Britain, you'll teach Great Britain a lesson about the value of American trade, and they'll be less prone to undertake these policies that were very damaging to American trade. And this is something, once England and France are fighting with each other beginning in the early 1790s and then all the way through the end of the War of 1812, as we call it in the States, they are constantly targeting American merchants for trading with the other country. And they're seizing American trade in the Atlantic repeatedly for this, for what is typically not illegal, but which they are going to criminalize based on what they want out of their war effort. So the embargoes are America's response to these policies. By and large, the embargoes do not work. And given how the custom houses worked in the 1790s and then before that in the British Empire, where these merchants have such an incredibly powerful sway over how things are going to work on the ground, I think you can understand why the embargoes are a tough ask of customs officials, because they spend all this time building these relationships with merchants and making the custom house a kind of friendly place for the merchant, and then all of a sudden are asked to shift that policy and become more coercive. Now, we saw this with the American Revolution, right, where the British Empire was asking its customs officials to all of a sudden switch the terms of negotiation with the merchants. And now we see it again with the embargoes, where the Republicans are asking customs officials to do it. And in both instances, the policies don't work. And the Jeffersonian embargo is a pretty dramatic failure. Madison will try a couple major programs which also don't come to fruition. And the way I see it, the failure of these programs and the inability of customs officials to shake the sway of an influence of local merchants is really the reason the United States ends up in the War of 1812, because there's no alternative left to fight back against the European powers. The war is really the only thing on the table. I'm glad you told us that Thomas Jefferson expected U.S. custom officers to enforce these embargoes. Because as we know, Jefferson came into office and one of his first actions was a drastic cut to the Army and Navy, which left us to wonder how Jefferson actually planned to enforce the embargoes. Now that we know Jefferson's enforcement plan, would you tell us how he expected custom officials to enforce the embargoes without an Army and Navy? There's a couple different ways to think through this, but Jefferson is not all that explicit about his expectation that customs officials will do so. So I have to do a little bit of digging here. One broad answer is that Jefferson was an optimist about American patriotism and nationalism. And I think that particularly given the train of events that lead the United States into the embargo of 1808, Jefferson believed that customs officials would feel that kind of swell of patriotic duty. And 
and that they would take to heart the importance of getting the embargo right and that they would be able to enforce the policy. And this proves to be a bit of a miscalculation. One of the curious things about it is that Jefferson is kind of notorious, as is Jackson down the road, for supposedly replacing all the Federalist officers with Republicans. But he doesn't actually do this. It's been pretty overstated in the scholarship about Jefferson. So he ends up with a lot of Federalist officials who are still running custom houses throughout the country. And, you know, you might suspect that, well, these are the guys who are responsible for not doing what Jefferson wants. But in reality, it's pretty widespread. It's a lot of the Republicans also who are not heeding the instructions. Now, the instructions themselves are pretty important here, too, because one of the things about legal culture in this time period is that if you look at the laws they passed, they were really short. They were really short. So you have an embargo that law that's going to cut off all American trade with the world for the most part, and it's a couple pages long. There's a bunch of footnotes. So compare that with today, where one of our politicians' chief bugaboos, of course, is the length of bills, and we see them constantly carrying around these gigantic reams of paper and thundering about how, I guess, they have to carry around these gigantic reams of paper. But back then, these were very short, and the reason they're short is because there's an expectation that you don't spell out every little detail. This gives some flexibility for officers who have to implement laws to figure out the best ways to do it. And this is kind of what we see with the embargo as well. But the Jeffersonians, particularly Gallatin and Jefferson, hedge their bet a bit. And they also start dispatching these official instructions from the Secretary of the Treasury to customs officials, which spell out in some more detail how these things are supposed to work. But again, after a long stretch of a legal culture where customs officers are expected to innovate and find ways to get things done, it was not a realistic approach to ask them to simply do as they're being told. And all of this kind of comes to a head in an 1808 legal case called Gilchrist v. Collector of Charleston, in which the issue is whether the federal government can instruct its officers, the customs officers, to seize goods based upon this embargo law, to put it very generally. And what happens is that this ends up in front of a circuit court of the United States and Associate Justice William Johnson, who had just been appointed by Jefferson to the Supreme Court of the United States, is one of the justices who hears the case. And he writes the opinion, which really takes takes Jefferson to task for trying to do this. And in particular, calls out this idea that the customs official can be told what to do based on the embargo law. And Johnson says, this is absolutely incorrect. There's nothing in the embargo law that would allow the federal government to do this. Rather, and he uses this term exactly, he says that there's a discretion that the customs official has to decide how to implement the law. So this is a huge blow to Jefferson, and it really knocks the wind out of the sails of the embargo and makes it virtually unenforceable. This is in the early summer of 1808, so it's only been in place for a few months at this point, and it's basically finished by then. And, you know, that's this conflict between whether the government can demand officers to act how it wants or whether the officers innovate on how they're going to run their office is really the crux of we see the conflict over the embargo. And you see once the officers have discretion to interpret the laws and implement them as they see fit, then there's this incredible space for the local commercial communities to wield influence over them. You know, the embargo is this very telling moment about why this state is operating in this way and why the merchants have such influence over how it's going to work. And of course, the custom officers didn't just have legal space to maneuver in, they had a lot of physical space too. Enforcing an embargo against Great Britain didn't just mean Great Britain across the Atlantic, Britain still occupied Canada to the north and the Great Lakes region to the west. Gautham, were there custom houses and officials in the Great Lakes region and along the United States-Canadian border to enforce the embargoes too? Absolutely. At this point, you have two of the real trouble hotspots around this time are the Canadian border is a big one. And then down as you get towards Spanish Florida, Amelia Island is a big problem spot as well. And in both cases, U.S. federal government is largely unable to do all that much. I delve into the Canadian border issues to some extent, but there's an outstanding book called Borderland Smuggling by Joshua Mitchell Smith, which really is an in-depth look at this problem. And it's quite stunning. The port of Passamaquoddy in Maine is this focal point for a 
bustling trade that violates the embargo pretty explicitly. You have grain that's being shipped up from places like Baltimore all the way up to Passamaquoddy, or Quaddy as it's called for short, and that finds its way into British Canada, but then also finds its way into the Iberian Peninsula eventually, where you have armies. This is the era of the Napoleonic Wars, and you have armies that need feeding, and Baltimore grain is going to make its way all the way through Maine, all the way over to the Iberian Peninsula. So these custom houses are just overrun by the scope and scale of the smuggling. In some instances, there's probably some complicity between customs officials and smugglers. In other instances, again, it's the sheer magnitude of it. On the New York border with Canada, for instance, you had customs officials who were essentially forced indoors at night under the threat of violence. And once they're indoors, a flourishing open smuggling trade is occurring in places like Oswego. So there are you know, different ways that it works depending on the specific port or town that we're talking about. But by all means, that Canadian border is rife with smuggling. Albert Gallatin, Secretary of the Treasury, actually sends secret agents, as he calls them, into Montreal to try and figure out just how big this trade is. And he, he gets a pretty discouraging report back. And eventually, toward the beginning of the War of 1812, the U.S. federal government actually virtually abandons its customs posts on that Canadian border and pulls back to try and catch smuggling as it's coming further south into places like Albany. So you have a kind of retreat. That's how massive the smuggling was at these spots. It sounds like when established, the custom house was orderly in the sense that officers did their job. They used discretion to find ways to work with merchants to collect the duties the government needed to function. But all of this fell apart during the Jefferson administration because collectors were asked to enforce embargoes, which merchants didn't want to comply with and many officials didn't want to enforce. And this gave rise to rampant smuggling. How did the government rein collectors and merchants back in and return the customs service to an orderly arm of government? Well, money, as is often the case with government, ends up being the pressing issue because one of the things about the embargo policy is that when you cut off trade and imported goods, you're also cutting off customs duties and therefore cutting off revenue to the government. And so what had happened between 1790 and 1807 is that you'd have a pretty significant and robust revenue coming in that was able to defray the costs of paying officers and then paying the interest on debt and maybe some other smaller programs. But once you cut off trade and imported goods, revenue plunges. And so in 1808, you had revenue comes in at about $16 million in customs revenue. This is partly an accounting trick by Albert Gallon, just using saved money from previous years. But then within the following year in 1809, it plunges down to about $7 million. And the following year is still at about $8 million. You know, it'll tick up and down. During the War of 18. 12, when again, a lot of trade is cut off, you go to about 6 million, 7 million. So these are not major sums. They're big problems for a government that is increasingly in debt at this point. And order is restored after the War of 1812 in terms of revenue and taxation. You start getting some enormous figures in customs revenue after the War of 1812. 1816 sees about 36 million in customs revenue. The following year, 26 million. So you have numbers that are significantly higher than they used to be. One of the reasons this occurs, one of the reasons that there can be some order is that those old places where merchants find their wealth in smuggling, they're kind of disappearing pretty fast because the United States had built its import and export economy upon an Atlantic world that was almost perpetually at war and always had these places where smuggling could bring incredible wealth very quickly. But once France loses the Napoleonic Wars, and once the War of 1812 is over, you have an incredible standardization of the Atlantic marketplace, the economy, and trade becomes very regularized all of a sudden, and those illegal opportunities disappear. And so, you know, in terms of regulating smuggling, there's very little to regulate after 1815. Embargoes disappear pretty rapidly. There's no more riots at custom houses. There's no more anger about regulations that are contrary to the merchant's collective desire because you have a fairly friendly market for them. So tax revenue increases, commercial wealth is pretty strong, but that's the basic story here of why things are able to go back to some sense of normalcy. 
Today, our federal government raises most of its revenue from income taxes and some from excise taxes, those taxes on luxury goods like furs and cigarettes. But is there anything from this early republic period, the age of the custom house, that contributes to our present-day fiscal system? There is. I mean, the irony here is that my wife is actually a customs attorney, so we talk a great deal about then and now, or I should say I talk a great deal about then and now. The statutory foundation of the customs system is pretty similar to what it used to be. We now have a much more detailed tariff, which spells out in minutia rates of duty about things. And customs revenue is still a significant part of how the fiscal systems work, although it's, as a share, it's much, much smaller than it used to be. But I do think that this idea of using the tariff as an instrument of political positioning and geopolitical positioning that we saw so powerfully with the Jeffersonian example of the embargoes. I mean, that is a major element of how and why we have a tariff system today. If you think about some of the biggest issues in the presidential election of 2016, for instance, the Trans-Pacific deal, which is mired in Congress right now, would renegotiate the terms upon which certain American relationships with certain countries in Asia and tariff rates and things of that nature. The legacy of NAFTA and its reforms toward dutiable goods in Canada and Mexico, for instance, and Mr. Trump's proposals about raising punitive tariffs on China as a punishment for currency manipulation, for instance. So these are clearly, you know, still important things that weigh on the minds of policymakers and voters. Let's move into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if the custom officials appointed by President Washington, had not viewed it as their duty to use their office to provide permanency and legitimacy to the new federal government after 1787. What would have happened to the United States government if custom collectors had not been able to forge a cooperative relationship with importing merchants? The question is a tough one. I think that it goes to the secondary question of why Washington chose who he chose in order to get that permanency. Just a quick primer on who the people he appointed, these tended to be people who had a great deal of experience as merchants or as people who had been the collector of a customs tax under the state governments. And so he kind of baked in this sense of permanency already by giving people the official and the custom house that they were already familiar with. Right, And that was a very tactical decision on Washington's part. But then he also chose these people from backgrounds of great responsibility. High-ranking officers in the military, people who had held positions in the state governments, who had been part of Continental Congress, who had that sense of republicanism that they felt a duty to be part of the group that was responsible for the fate of this republic. So I think that the only way the question could have gone differently here about if they did not feel it their duty is that if Washington chose less wisely or chose different people from a different group. Now, the closest possible answer here is if he chose people who were just political hacks, who were kind of just his supporters, who he thought, this person needs a job, that person needs a job, so I'll give him some post and I'm not really all that invested in how they perform. It's just, I'm going to do this to build a political party as opposed to the broader sense of duty that he was looking for in these appointees. So if he had done that, and I realize that's a long preface to answering the question. So if he had done that and these officers did not feel it their duty to provide permanency and legitimacy, then I think we would have ended up with a federal government that would have been a far more controversial entity than it ended up being. The challenges to federal supremacy in a political sense that we see are not all that many up until the Civil War. You have the Hartford Convention during the time of the War of 1812. That's really the biggest challenge. But really, other than that, we don't see it. So I do think that that may have occurred if the federal government was seen as this sort of racket for the Federalist Party. I do think that the demise of the Federalists would likely have been hastened as well. You know, they had that decade in office, but had Washington placed less emphasis on this infrastructure of governance than the election 
election of 1796 would probably have gone very differently than it did. We would not have a revolution of 1800. We might have a revolution of 1796. And it's difficult to look well beyond that. I do think that one thing that makes the question a bit tougher to answer than maybe a different counterfactual is that a lot of what happens is dictated by foreign affairs, by what's going on in France and in England. And so those events would probably have occurred anyway. I don't think they were very dependent on anything going on in the U.S. And so the similar set of challenges, embargoes and commercial restrictions and that sort of stuff would have probably occurred anyway. Gautam, now that you've taken a deep dive into studying custom houses, what are you researching and writing about now? Well, I'm working on a bunch of things right now. I have a couple spin-off pieces about the custom houses. I have a couple articles in the works that are thinking about the changing ways that historians are thinking through ideas of governance and the state in the context of early America. And I'm beginning my next big book project, which is about the role of fugitive slave laws in building the concept of the state between 1789 and 1865. And here I'm looking at one peculiar part of these fugitive slave laws that tend to demand that free, white, able-bodied men participate if called upon to help in the recapture of a runaway or fugitive slave. And so I look at these as growing an influence over time and one to see what sort of idea Southern slaveholders had about the government that they wanted. Where is the best place to look for more information about you and how we can contact you if we still have questions about the early Custom House? Well, I'm very active on Twitter. I can be reached there at at Gautam Rao. You'll find lots about the New York Mets and my beloved Liverpool Football Club, but also lots and lots of history talk. I have a website that's uh, gothamrao.weebly.com, and there's more about my ongoing projects, some of my teachings discussed there, and a usually up-to-date list of publications. And then your listeners are always welcome to email me, grao at american.ed which is also listed on my faculty page at the American University History Department website. Gautam Rao, thank you for taking us through early American custom houses and their responsibilities. Thanks for having me, Liz. I really appreciate it. The early United States Custom Service may be one of the unsung heroes of the early American Republic. I know, it's hard to imagine tax men as saving the day. Yet, it seems like early custom officers' ability to work with import merchants actually allowed them to collect the revenue the new federal government needed to survive. The early Customs Service owed a good deal of its success to George Washington. Washington appointed men who shared his vision of a strong national government and who worked to help him bring that vision into being. By negotiating with individual merchants when they needed to, customs officers helped give strength to the new national government. And few questioned their practices because it allowed the customs officers to collect the money the new government had to have to function. Well, few questioned them, that is, until Thomas Jefferson and the Democratic Republicans assumed office in 1801. Now, Jefferson and his fellow Democratic Republicans looked upon the Customs Service with a wary eye. And yet, it's ironic, because as Gautam explained, Jefferson and Madison needed the support of customs officials just as much, if not more, than their Federalist predecessors, because both Jefferson and Madison needed those custom officers to enforce their administration's embargoes. As we heard, enforcement of those embargoes didn't always work. Sometimes custom officers in places with lucrative international trade opportunities, like those along the U.S.-Canadian border, didn't enforce the laws. Other times, merchants and their supporters prevented enforcement by threatening crowd action. After the War of 1812, though, enforcement became a non-issue, because peace came, the embargoes ended, and the merchants went back to paying their import duties, which ultimately gave the federal government a good portion of the money it needed to survive and thrive into the early republic. For more information about Gautam, his book, National Duties, plus notes for everything we talked about today, check out the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 098. If you enjoy Ben Franklin's World, please consider making a donation to help support it. Visit benfranklinsworld.com slash movement for more details. If a financial donation isn't possible, and you'd still like to help support the show, please tell people about it. The best way for a podcast to find new listeners is by word of mouth support. Finally, do you think the founders would have drafted the Constitution of 1787 if the Articles of Confederation had provided the American government 
with the power to tax? Send your answers to Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment on the show notes page or in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.